We are the paradoxical ape. Bipedal, naked, large-brained. Long the master of fire, tools, and language, but still trying to understand ourselves. Aware that death is inevitable, yet filled with optimism. We grow up slowly. We hand down knowledge. We empathize and deceive. We shape the future from our shared understanding of the past. Carta brings together experts from diverse disciplines to exchange insights on who we are and how we got here. An exploration made possible by the generosity of humans like you. Today, what I'd like to talk to you about is uh, what we know about the domestication of crop species and uh, the impacts of the impact of crops and agriculture has had on the Anthropocene. So in many of these talks that I give, I usually start with this picture, which is, I don't know what to call it. I, uh, let's call it a, a New York kitchen sink pizza where you've asked for every topping on this pizza imaginable. Um, maybe not pineapples. Um, pineapples and pizza is an abomination, so we'll not go there. But then I challenge usually my students or the audience to tell me how many species they think are in this pizza. Usually they'll say, oh, there's five or 10 species. If you look and count the number of species, and I've done that several times, I think there are 16 species on this pizza. There are uh, products of three animal species. There are three fungal species. And there are between... 11 to 12 anim, uh, plant species, depending on how you count. And the interesting thing about this is that all of these species have evolved only in the last 12,000 years. These are relatively new species in the evolutionary time scale. And they're new species because they are a special class of species we call domesticated species. And so what are domesticated species? Domesticated species are species that have evolved with humans and under human control, um, so that we can derive resources or services from them. The most important, of course, are food. Um, we use domesticated crop species and domesticated livestock species as our primary sources of nourishment as humans. And all of these species are unique in that they've only evolved in the last 12,000 years. And they've evolved in the last 12,000 years um, in, in the presence of humans and under the control of humans. So all of this is a, is a special evolutionary process. This comes about by a special evolutionary process we call domestication. And domestication is this process that arises because of this very unique mutualism between two species. In this case, humans on one hand, and what we now know of as our domesticated crops or maybe our domesticated livestock. And in this mutualism, what happens is that you get evolution mostly of the domesticated species like maize or rice or apples or so on, under human associated selection. This is because humans have created a new environment for these species to grow and thrive in. These are the farms or orchards or gardens. Um, and also humans sometimes directly choose several kinds of varieties or traits that they're interested in, in propagating to the next generation. And over time, because these species are evolving in association with humans, you see the development of new species and also the development of different differences between species that arises because of this domestication process. Now, we really don't know how many domesticated species there are. By some estimates, there are between 250 and 1,000 domesticated plant species and between 40 and 50 domesticated animal species. And there are several features about domestication and these domesticated species. First of all, many of these species have evolved so that you can really tell that they're very different from their ancestors. So here on the left, you see maize or zea maize, corn as we know it. 
And you can see the traditional corn cob with its multiple ranks of kernel rows and the structure of the corn plant shown on the left. But on the right, you see its ancestor, Teosinte. You can see just by looking at it that Teosinte and maize are very different from each other. The structure of the plant is very different. The, the, the cob, if you will, of Teosinte is very different. It's only one row of kernels, unlike in uh, the modern corn cob, which has multiple rows of kernels. These are just some of the differences that evolved in these species uh, as the domestication process has occurred. And this domestication process actually has taken place really because of a change in human behavioral ecology uh, in the way we survived. So if you think about most of human history, um, the way we got our nutrition, for example, our food is we were hunters and gatherers. Uh, in terms of plants, we went out and gathered um, probably wild nuts, wild grains, and wild fruits in order for um, humans to survive. But starting 12,000 years ago, something happened in uh, the human species. Instead of depending on wild plants uh, as their source of sustenance, um, we decided to deliberately plant these species and cultivate them. So we took these wild species and started to plant them and harvest the, the, the seed or the fruits for the next generation and then planted them again and again and again. And this process of cultivation and harvesting things started to develop. So for one thing, we developed this new environment called farms. So before these wild species were out in the wild, now they're in this environment that we created for them, which we now call the farm. And the process by which we cultivated and harvested them, we took charge of the reproduction and the dispersal. So no longer were these wild plants um, uh, reproducing in the wild. We as humans began to take control of how these plants reproduced and survive to the next generation. And all of these develop these evolutionary pressures on these species to, to become new species or new populations, which we now know as domesticated species. Now, all of this happened actually relatively recently uh, in the last 12,000 years. So almost all domesticated species we know of with the possible exception of, uh, of dogs uh, almost all, domestica all domesticated plant species and almost all domesticated animal species evolved only in the last 12,000 years. Uh, and, and this evolved during a period which uh, geologically is known as the Holocene, where there was a stable climate uh, on the planet. Prior to that, we had more unstable climate. And during this instability in the climate uh, prior to 12,000 years ago, um, it was not a good environment by which agriculture could thrive. After about 12,000 years ago with the stabilization of the climate after the last, the last glacial maximum, it became possible for humans to become farmers and so developed these systems of agriculture and led to the domestication of these many species that we now rely on for our food, uh, for our clothing and other aspects of our existence. Now this all originated first of all in a, a, an area called the Fertile Crescent that some of you may recognize this, um, in, in this area. Uh, the Fertile Crescent is an area that go, spans from the Levant into the, um, the mountains of uh, Southern Turkey, Southeastern Turkey, into modern day um, Iraq and possibly into Iran. And it is this area where we think the first agriculture was practiced by humans. And this is also where the first crop species evolve. Uh, these are wheat, barley, rye, oats, lentils, peas, all of these, what we might call the founder crops uh, of, uh, especially of the Western world originated from um, in the Fertile Crescent. But actually agriculture started uh, in different parts of the world. Um, it's believed independently from each other. So aside from the Fertile Crescent in this area that, uh, that is now in the Middle East, uh, agriculture we think also independently arose in China. And there they domesticated things like rice and uh, millets and um, soybeans. Uh, and in the new world, there was also an independent evolution of agri agriculture. And there they uh, you know, domesticated maize and squashes and beans and potatoes um, and sunflowers here in Eastern North America. So we still don't know why humans chose to move from hunting and foraging to a prim primarily hunting and foraging to a primarily agricultural lifestyle. But it's clear that this happened around the world in different societies, possibly independently from each other. And once agriculture was invented as a system, it actually took off so that around the world, 
we think there are at least 24 regions where domestication of crops took place. Uh, and this occurred on, on, on every continent uh, in the world, except possibly Australia. Now, this took place, as I said, starting 12,000 years ago. And when, when domestication took place, it occurred over a prolonged period of time. And this is actually something that's quite new because uh, a, few, a few decades ago, it was believed that domestication occurred quite rapidly. So the models for how um, plants were domesticated into crops uh, suggested that it occurred very rapidly. And in some models, it occurred even as uh, in a short time span, like a few hundred years. However, more recent data, first from archeological work, uh, and then later on, or more recently from genomic data from my lab and other laboratories, it suggests that the process of domestication and the, uh, the origin of agriculture may have taken place over a much wider span of time. So right now, I think the pre prevailing idea is that um, domestication of crops took place in a protracted uh, manner. Uh, and instead of just a few hundred years for these crops to evolve, it may have taken thousands of years. Um, this is seen, for example, in the agricultural record, where if you look at archeological sites, you see that indicators of domestication in plants like barley and wheat uh, arose in populations and didn't go into fixation. That is, didn't spread throughout the entire species immediately, but it, it took about you know, two to 4,000 years for a trait that we think of as a domestication trait to spread to the entire species. So domestication as an evolutionary process didn't occur very rapidly. We think it occurred over several thousands of years. And with the rise of domestication and the ensuing stability in food resources and agricultural surplus, what it did was intensify the sedentary lifestyle of humans and it gave, eventually gave rise to cities. And with the rise of cities developed many of the aspects we now see in uh, modern human societies, things like specialization and division of labor, uh, the rise of trading economies, the development of monumental art and architecture, of centralized administration, of hierarchical ideologies, things like writing and things like property ownership. All of these can be traced to the rise of cities, which themselves can be traced to the domestication of crops and animals by which these cities eventually um, survived. And not only did, the, did agriculture and uh, uh, rise up, but and the domestication of these species uh, uh, occur, but these species then spread around the world. So in this map of modern earth, in the, the sections on green, you see where agriculture is intensively practiced, where the land has been uh, changed over to agriculture. And as you can see, agriculture is no longer confined to the small area in the Middle East called the Fertile Crescent or this portion in, uh, of China or the Mexican highlands. Now agriculture is practiced across a very large portion of the Earth's surface. Uh, and this is in, indeed one of the, uh, the hallmarks of the Anthropocene that uh, we have transformed the landscape so that large tracts of land are no longer uh, left over to natural processes, but were developed under human control uh, and, and human development. You can see the, the quite amazing spread of uh, crops across the landscape in this, uh, in this slide, where what we've done is we've looked at uh, the archaeological record, and we see where you see evidence of rice agriculture. And starting on the upper left about 9,000 years ago, you see that rice agriculture occurs only in a few patchy areas around the Yangtze Valley of China. And then for the next 4,000 years, it's really confined to this area between the Yangtze Valley and the Yellow River until it occurs about 5,000 or 4,000 years ago. And then starting about 4,000 years ago, you see a rapid spread of rice agriculture um, all throughout East Asia and then into Southeast Asia. And before you know it, almost all of Asia is now practicing rice agriculture. So in a period of about 9,000 years, you see this crop move from a very restricted area in the world to now dominating an entire continent. And in fact, rice is now grown in all of the continents of the world, except for Antarctica. My lab has tried to look at both archeological data as well as in genomic data, looking at the DNA sequences of traditional rice varieties to try to reconstruct the spread of rice and actually other crop species as well. And, and this is from a more recent paper we did where we showed that 
what I just told you, rice was originally restricted to this area between the Yellow River and the Yangtze River. But starting about 4,000 years ago, there was a, a climate event that occurred, which we know of as the 4.2K event. And what happened worldwide with the 4.2K event is that you start to see a cooling uh, in the world. And what happens to rice at that, uh, at that moment is two things happen. First of all, several rice populations developed to be more adapted to the temperate climate that you now see associated with this cooling of the planet. And so this is the rice that then moves on to Korea and Japan. Uh, this is the rice you see when you, when you eat, when you eat sushi. And then rice starts to move southwards. It starts to move to Southeast Asia, both mainland and island Southeast Asia. And it spreads quite rapidly. Starting about 3,500 years ago, you start to see it appearing in mainland Southeast Asia and spreading into island Southeast Asia. And in fact, a more recent reconstruction we did both using both archaeology and genomic sequences, you can see this kind of this, this, this loop that rice has made throughout Asia. So starting about 4,200 years ago or so 4,100 years ago with this climate change event called the 4.2K event, we start to see the emergence of temperate rice and then tropical rice that moves further southward into Southeast Asia, loops up through island Southeast Asia from Indonesia into the Philippines, eventually makes its way all the way to Taiwan. In the meantime, the more temperate rice varieties actually makes its way southward to Taiwan as well. And they meet up, this tropical rice and this temperate rice meets up in the island of Taiwan. So you can see that in a period of less than uh, two to 3,000 years, rice has spread all over East and Southeast Asia. And this type, this story is actually seen over and over again in most of the major crop species we rely on for our sustenance as humans. And with the movement of crops, we see a transformation of the landscape. These areas, which were what we might call wild areas or natural areas, were transformed by humans in order to practice agriculture. Certainly, you can see this in uh, uh, Southeast Asia and South Asia, where you see terraces for rice agriculture in the mountains and the hillsides, in the Philippines, in mainland Southeast Asia, and South China, and in Indonesia and Bali, for example. And this just illustrates, again, in the Anthropocene, this large scale transformation we see of the landscape. But not only the, uh, the, the land is transformed, but even our atmosphere is transformed. So for example, if you look at uh, methane, which is a major greenhouse gas, it doesn't get as much attention as CO2, but it still is a very potent greenhouse gas. Um, methane cycles in the atmosphere, it has its ups and downs uh, throughout history. And based on what we know in the past, methane levels should have been going down in the atmosphere starting about 5,000 years ago. So that dash line where methane levels were predicted to have gone down based on what was known in the past. But instead from records, uh, from ice core records, you see that methane is actually increasing in the atmosphere. And it's increasing starting about 3,000 years ago, or sorry, I'm sorry, 5,000 to 4,000 years ago. Um, and it was a big puzzle why methane production and the methane levels in the atmosphere were going up rather than down as had been predicted. And it's believed now that part of the reason is the spread of rice and rice paddy agriculture. It turns out that rice paddies are a major source of methane. And in fact, the rise of methane in the atmosphere over the last 4,000 years mirrors the spread of rice paddy agriculture in Asia. And a colleague of mine, Dorian Fuller at the University of College London, has essentially mapped the spread of rice paddy agriculture and shown that paddy agriculture and its expansion is responsible in part for its increase in methane concentration. So you can see how the spread of agriculture is giving rise not only to transformation of the land, but transformation of the atmosphere as well. And finally, it has also has an impact on us humans. Uh, we humans are now evolving as a result of our relationship with these domesticated crops and animals, which we rely on primarily for our food. So a major uh, evolutionary change in humans, for example, is the evolution of lactase persistence, uh, our ability to tolerate milk as adults. This mutation and its spread uh, occurred in human cultures that adopted dairy or dairy livestock as a source of nutrition. So in the Middle East and into Europe and also in parts of Sub-Saharan Africa. And in fact, the persistence of uh, lactase in adulthood uh, can be traced to the movement of these dairying cultures in many different parts of the world. 
The other change in humans is, for example, the number of copies of the amylase gene. Amylase is the enzyme uh, which we use to digest starch. Um, and in, in the human genome, it's actually found in several copies. And what was found several years ago was that those societies or those cultures that relied on uh, cereal grains uh, or starch uh, for primarily for their nutrition had more copies of this gene in their genome than societies that relied, say, on meat um, for their diet. This was an interesting correlation that suggested, again, that the um, relationship of humans with their domesticated crop species, in this case, domesticated grain, resulted in an, a genetic evolutionary change in humans, in which case um, you have an increased copy number of this crucial enzyme gene that's responsible for starch breakdown. So humans themselves are now evolving and continue to be in the process of evolving as a, a result of our interaction and our relationship with these domesticated crops and animals that we rely on now for our nutrition. So domestication uh, has been called one of the pivotal uh, evolutionary events on the planet. Uh, it certainly was one of both the consequence and also associated with the rise of agriculture, which in itself has been a major feature of what we consider the Anthropocene. Um, and the question now is, where do we go from here as humans? Uh, where are we? Well, in many ways, we're stuck with agriculture. Um, many, uh, many investigators, including my friend Dorian Fuller at University of College London and others, have called agriculture a labor trap for humans. We've been trapped into agriculture as a system by which we gain most of our nutrition. And so for better or for worse, for the uh, immediate future, we're stuck with agriculture as the major system by which we feed ourselves as humans. And we continue to rely on these domesticated species for our nutrition and for parts of our clothing and so on. Um, but we're faced with challenges as humans. For one thing, human populations, because of better agriculture, um, human populations are increasing. And in order to meet the uh, nutritional needs of humans, we also have to increase our agricultural output. It's been predicted that uh, our yields of maize, rice, wheat, and soybean, for example, need to increase by 60% uh, over the next 30 years to meet the population in the year 2050. Now, this is a daunting challenge, and you might be heartened to know that actually yields have continued to increase in our crops by the rate of 1% a year due to uh, basically implementation of scientific uh, agronomic practices, as well as the development of new varieties that allow for an increase in uh, yields in the farm. The problem is that a 1% increase every year is no longer enough. We have to increase our yields by 2% a year in order to meet um, the increasing population we find uh, the planet uh, in. And also in the face of things like climate change and increasing urbanization, that is making the land that we use for agriculture either deteriorate or get smaller and smaller. We face this challenge um, as, a, as a species. Uh, and the, the crisis in agriculture has been known for some time. This was 10 years ago in the New York Times where they devoted an entire feature to what they call the crisis in agriculture, where they called attention to the rise in human populations. Uh, and the fact that even though grain production was increasing, uh, and so grain production per capita was quite constant, um, this, this was not going to continue uh, in the foreseeable future. And in fact, one way we're seeing that is we're seeing uh, spikes in the prices of food products over time as we begin to put more and more stress and pressure on a world agricultural system. So one of the challenges we, we face as humans is how are we going to practice agriculture in a sustainable fashion to feed more and more people in the future? So domestication of crops, which is what led to the rise of agriculture is something that has occurred on the planet and it's a hallmark of the Anthropocene over the last 12,000 years. Uh, and and over, over these 12,000 years, we've learned how to live with these domesticated crops and animals and we've expanded them throughout the world. And now we're faced as, as humans with uh, the, the challenge of how to be able to use this domesticated crops and animals in a more sustainable fas fashion to feed an increasingly growing world population in the face of these major um, climate and land stresses that we face. 
So I thank you very much for your attention. And um, I hope you learned something from this. And uh, we'll be able to answer questions later on. Thank you very much. Thank you.